Welcome to Clear Creek Community Church Online. My name is Aaron Lutz and I'm the campus pastor at our East 96 campus. You know, Clear Creek is made up of multiple campuses located throughout the Bay Area of Houston. And while we're so glad you have joined us online to watch the sermon today, you should know that we believe life is better when we do it together. When we, when we gather as a church, we say often that it's this non-downloadable experience. I mean, singing together and praying together and, and serving each other. Those are things that just don't translate online, but they're essential to the entire experience of becoming a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. And so I'd encourage you and make plans to check out the campus nearest to you and see what worshiping and living in community is really all about. You can visit us online at clearcreek.org to find more information about our locations, our service times, and a whole lot more. We hope to see you soon. All right, kids, it's time for the Christmas story. The birth of Jesus Christ. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. And Joseph also went up from Galilee to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. I just love it when he reads this story. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And a great sign appeared in the heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head, a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and 10 horns and on his heads, seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. Now, I don't know about you guys. Uh, I'm assuming that's a Christmas those kids will never forget. I don't know about little Johnny, what he's going to get for tomorrow for Christmas morning, but I hope it's a new pair of PJs because he just soiled the ones that he was just in looking at that. What's wrong with Grandpa? Is he hitting too much of the eggnog at night, having a senior moment? Because all of a sudden, the Christmas story turned into something like Lord of the Rings or Game of Thrones was the dragon thrown in there. And you might say, like, come on, Grandpa, what's up with all of that? It's kind of a little crazy. That's a little off the cuff and off the hinges, maybe. But what if I were to tell you uh, that Grandpa wasn't just kind of uh, ad-libbing. He wasn't just riffing on the Christmas story, that he was actually reading the Christmas story. Listen, we all know the general story of Christmas. We know about Joseph and Mary. We know about baby, uh, baby Jesus, the, the shepherds, the angels, Buddy the Elf. We got it. We know about all of it, right? Uh, and because we know about it so much, it feels a little old hat. It feels like, oh, we got this down. We know it. We've seen it. And so all of a sudden, if we're not careful, we can begin to hit uh, autopilot in the season, where now we're thinking more about the gifts we're going to open tomorrow, or um, the presents that we forgot to give or get, or maybe what we're going to have for our big Christmas dinner or uh, lunch, however your families do it, instead of being amazed at the wonder that Christ came to earth in the form of a person, a little baby who grew up and went to a cross and rose from the dead, and all of that kicked off uh, two, roughly 2,000 years ago. It's why we're here to celebrate that. But what if I told you uh, that, that that holy night, that silent night in the manger, wasn't just the birth of a baby, but it was the beginning of a battle. In fact, the, the, the song that we just had sung for us, the reason that you saw the images that you did is not because we were trying to clip in pieces from Infinity War Endgame or anything like that. It's because we wanted you to see that in the birth of a child, there was something cosmic going on. A cosmic battle, I would argue, that starts to rage, not just in the earth, but more so in the heavens, just because this baby is been, has been born. And you may not realize this or not, but you're in the big, fat middle of it, right in the middle of it. Well, hold on, Yance. I've never, I've never heard of that story of Christmas. That's not, that never made the cut for any of the years that I've been alive where we talked about the Christmas story. Precisely. So let's just do me a favor. Let, 
let old Grandpa Yancey, I'm not there yet, but Grandpa Yancey just open up a Bible here and tell you the Christmas story you've never heard in the hopes that tonight and tomorrow and the rest of this Christmas season has a little more weight for you in your soul, a little more significance uh, when you think about what this is all about and a little more reckoning with each one of us. So uh, the big question is, where do, you, where do you get to the other side of that story? What was the crazy uncle or grandpa reading out of the Bible? Well, uh, I, I'm sure you probably realize it's not from the traditional Christmas narratives, not out of Mark, excuse me, not out of Matthew, not out of Luke. It is out of the book of Revelation. That's right, Revelation. Now, many of you are here, you're guests with us tonight. You, you haven't been to Clear Creek. Uh, this is your first time here. As uh, our campus pastor said, welcome, we're glad that you're here. But you may not realize this, we kicked off this past year studying the book of Revelation. We did it for about 12 weeks. How many of you were a part of that, just by a show of hands? I just want to, oh, there you go. Um, that you can, anyone that raised their hand, you can ask them anything you want to about Revelation. <laughs> Got it down. <clears throat> and so here's what I want to do. I want to show you in Revelation a, a book that was written to seven churches that were undergoing incredible persecution in Asia Minor 2,000 years ago about what Christmas has to do with not just Revelation, but with you and me in this whole cosmic battle. Now, where do we find Christmas in Revelation? Glad you asked. Uh, we find it in Revelation chapter 12. Now, you don't have to turn there. I know it's Christmas. We usually have people that bring their Bibles, or maybe they put it on their smartphones. And if you have a Bible, or if you have it on your smartphone, you're more than welcome to turn with me there. We'll put it here on the screens for you as well. Let's look at Revelation chapter 12. Let's look at the first six verses, Okay. I'll just read them off the screen, actually. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head, a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant and crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. Oh, that sounds kind of familiar. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his head, heads, seven diadems. And his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that she might bore her, excuse me, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. You remember that from the video. She gave birth, verse five, she gave birth to a male child, one who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, but her child was caught up to God into his throne, and the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she, she is to be nourished for 1260 days. Now, before I go any further, let me just, a little brief recap and review for some of us that started the year with Revelation. Revelation is a, a book written in what's called the apocalyptic genre. That's a big fancy term that simply means this. Uh, there is high use of symbols and numbers and fantastical creatures that the author John is trying to use to communicate spiritual truths to his first century readers. And in the passage we just read, you see all three of those things. You see symbols, you see numbers, and you see fantastical creatures. Now, in reading through this, I, I'm, I'm assuming you guys could see where Christmas is in that passage. Verse 1 opens up, <clears throat> we have a woman pictured by John as uh, dressed in like the sun and the stars and the moon. Now, like, where did that come from? Well, actually, if you were a first century reader, you would know. If you were Jewish, you would know. That's the picture of uh, the same picture used in Genesis 37 of Israel. And so what John's trying to tell his first century readers, trying to telegraph, is right, this woman represents the community of God, God's people. And from this community, this true Israel is born a Messiah. And I, I'm assuming you saw that kid around, what, verse 5. In fact, we'll put it back on the screen and you can see it there, verse 5. Uh, this, this community gave birth through this community, through this true Israel. She gave birth to a male child, one who's to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Now that's it right there. Revelation tells us that there is the babe of Christmas. That's the nativity right there. So in the midst of donkeys and sheep and Joseph and Mary and shepherds and a manger, there was something dramatic going on in the spiritual realms. And John sees it this way as we've read. John sees the embodiment of evil as this, as this kingdom of darkness bent against God's kingdom. Pictured as a dragon for all of its ferocity. And it's got seven heads, it's got ten horns, and if you were with us, seven and ten are ideas of completion and of comprehensiveness, so this is a comprehensive evil. Now in John's day when he's writing this, uh, he saw this evidence of the dragon in the form of this government that was seeking out to persecute and extinguish Christianity. In John's day, it was Rome. But the reason he writes it the way that he writes it is that the dragon is always a telltale sign that it's never the work of just a government or a people or a group. There's the work of something and someone more sinister than that, the one who represents the dragon, the devil himself, Satan. 
In fact, uh, Revelation says here that when Jesus was born, Satan used his powers and his influence and his oppression through the powers that be to try to extinguish the life of the child. I'll just read it again. We can see it here on the screen. And the dragon, we'll put it on the screen if we can. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might what? Say it with grandpa. Devour it. What? He might devour the child. Now, how many of you remember the story of King Herod? Remember King Herod? Jesus is born. And then all of a sudden, some time later, we don't know how much time, probably two years pass, that uh, an angel comes up to Joseph and says, get the heck out of Dodge. That's a little abbreviation there. But he says, leave because your kid's about to be assassinated by the government. And then we realize that King Herod brings the wise men. You know, the wise men don't get there until probably a couple of years later. Most people miss that in the story. Jesus would have been a young child. And what does Herod do? Because he knows that he's missed his time, he kills all the children, male children, two years and under. Not not a time of joy or comfort in that age, but it was a time of conflict and war, and it's already begun. And we see this even in Revelation, that this was happening. But God spares, obviously, Jesus. See, we think of Christmas morning, and we should, as a time of fun and frivolity and joy and happiness. And again, we should do that thing, and we should feel those things. But in the spiritual realms, what we need to realize is That as soon as Jesus was born, it put Satan on the defense because now he knew something was afoot. This Messiah that Israel had been waiting for for centuries had now arrived. And that means his time as being kind of the ruler of the principalities and powers of the air, that was coming to an end. In fact, let's read more. In verses 7 through 12, here's what you'll find out. That after his scheme to try to to extinguish Jesus via Herod didn't work, uh, Jesus now had to start his ministry. And when Jesus started his ministry, all hell broke loose, so to speak. It says here, now a war, now a war arose in heaven. Now get that. Jesus is born. Now a war breaks out in heaven. And Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And we already told you who the dragon is. And the dragon and his angels, or his servants, we would call those the demonic, they fought back. But he was defeated, the dragon was, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan. Like, if you didn't know now, John's like, I'll just tell you who it is. The deceiver of the whole world. Notice what else it says. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, catch this, y'all. Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God And they have, I love this, and they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. Now listen, you don't know how much I want to speak for the next four hours to try to break this stuff down, but I'm not going to do that. So for the next three hours and 59 minutes, let me finish off with you guys. Let me summarize this for y'all. This is trying to also tell you the tenor of Jesus' ministry, that during Jesus' ministry, there was a cosmic battle in the heavens. Now, it's pictured in a very picturesque way. So John's not trying to tell us all the details. He's trying to give us the flavor of what's going on. But what you need to see in this text is this. While Jesus is doing his ministry in the, in the heavens or at battle, what we find out is that there was a deciding point, a deciding factor, an ultimate victory that was going to show that the war would be won just in some time later on. And that ultimate victory comes at the cross. That Jesus was born and he lives this perfect life and he goes to a cross and he dies at the cross and he rises from the grave. And when that happened, it changed everything. For everyone that believes upon Jesus now receives the victory that Jesus won. Verse 11, I'll just read it one more time. And they have, look on the top of the screen. And they, followers of Jesus, have conquered Satan, how? By the blood of the Lamb. And basically the word of their testimony is their faithfulness to the truth of the gospel. So here's what John's trying to tell us, albeit in an amazing picturesque way, that not only at the cross did Jesus um, secure our victory, think about it this way, think about it from a heavenly cosmic perspective, that he also ensured the defeat of Satan. And all of that started, the first domino that fell was Christmas. The first domino that tipped was the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem, when they laid him in the manger. Now, when you put it all together, here's what you have to understand. Christmas isn't just about the birth of a baby. It is, but it's more so about a battle begun. Think about that again. Christmas isn't merely about the birth of a baby. 
but of a battle begun. Because it's easy. I said this at the beginning. I'll say it again. It's really easy for you and I to slip into just kind of the stuff of Christmas. I mean, some of you, you're still wrapping presents tonight. You'll be wrapping them like 6 in the morning, hoping your kids get up like at 6.05. You're going to have all that pressure. Some of you have already put your Christmas turkey or your Christmas brisket. God bless you. Whatever you're doing, you're going to have all that stuff in your head. And I'm telling you, don't miss it. Don't miss what I'm talking about. Because what I'm talking about is eternal. What I'm talking to you about is the reason we even gather here, the reason you have your family sitting next to you, the reason you're even singing songs, the reason we have these kind of cheesy things so we won't burn down this building we just had for less than a year. I mean, the reason we have all this kind of stuff is not because of all the things we've mentioned. It's ultimately because there was a battle begun 2,000 years ago with the birth of a baby. And so amidst the holiday parties and the food and the presents, and those are good things. just want you to hear that. Those are good things. Um, it's easy for us to take our focus off of what the ultimate thing's about. And why Christmas was so important that even Satan himself tried to intervene to stop it. Because he knew this. He knew God was trying to conduct, get this, God was trying to conduct a rescue mission. Now some of you know that and some of you don't. The reason that Christmas is so important and the reason Satan wanted to stop it is because God was just beginning a rescue mission. The reason that Jesus came and that he lived this perfect life and that he died at the cross and that he rose from the dead is because God was seeking to redeem sinners people like you and me, back to himself. And, and this isn't new. I mean, God was even telegraphing this, not in Revelation, but all the way back to the traditional Christmas narratives when we have the angels speaking, when he says this. If you, yeah, Matthew 121. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, that's what the angel of the Lord told Joseph. Listen, you're going to name this kid Jesus. Why? Because he's going to save his people from their sins. Now, the question someone may need to ask is, Yancey, why do I need saving, man? I think I'm a pretty good guy or I'm a pretty good gal. Why am I? I'm, I'm, I'm doing okay. Why, why do I need to be in need of being saved? Because what the Bible teaches, if you look at it from start to finish, especially at the beginning, is that we've been broken from the beginning. From our initial parents on, we've, we, we happen to be good at sinning. You never have to teach a kid to disobey. You ever thought about that? You have, if you had a little kids, like, hey man, I need to tell you how to, how to cause a tantrum. I need to tell you how to break things. I need to show you how to steal. You don't have to tell them any of those things. Because that's natural to us. You know, greed and lust and um, avarice and uh, all those things are natural to us because we're broken from the beginning. It doesn't mean that we always do the bad thing. It just means we're as bad off as we can be when it's concerning God. And that's, that, it's almost like Satan uh, has got a little piece of us. Because we can't seem to shake free from that. And we experience that kind of oppression or dominion every day and uh, broken relationships and unmet promises and shame and guilt and anger and strife and you name it, and name it. It feels like sometimes you can get so low that it feels like Satan's even running your life. You might not even call it that, but the dragon's in full force and full effect. But Christmas shows us this, that God in his love and his mercy, he reached out in Jesus to do for us what we couldn't do. So the reason that we're sinners is because we've been broken from the beginning and that we can never be good enough for God. You can never perform enough for God. You can never obey enough for God because God's not matching you against your standard. He's matching you against his standard of goodness. By the way, that's perfection. But the beauty of Jesus is this. Jesus, where we disobeyed, Jesus obeyed. Where we, where we um, were unfaithful, Jesus was faithful. Where we where we failed, Jesus was successful. Where, where we dropped the ball and I dropped the ball, Jesus carried it all the way. And he did, from the birth to the cross to the empty tomb. All of it, right? And why? So that God might offer in Jesus, through uh, he might offer to broken humanity, an opportunity for them to come back. An opportunity for you and for me to return to the kingdom of God where Christ is king and his reign and ruler over all things. Because just so you know, that's coming, the fullness of that when Christ returns. But we get a chance to be a part of that now. And you're sitting around a lot of people who've already entered into that kingdom because here's how that entrance happens. It's not that you get better or do better things. It's that you put your life and give that life to Jesus, saying, Jesus, I trust you. I give my allegiance to you, and all that I know that I am, I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to trust in your goodness, not mine, your faithfulness, not my faithfulness. Your power, not my power. I'm going to trust in the grace of God, not in, my, not in my performance. That's the beauty of Christmas. Because what God does through us in Jesus, how he saves people from their sins, is he takes traitors and rebels and he makes them sons and daughters of the kingdom. He brings them in. 
He forgives you of your sins. Every sin that you've committed, every sin that you are committing right now, and every sin that you will commit, God forgives you in Christ of all of them. And not only that, he gives you restored relationships. He puts you into the, if you will, the woman full of stars and suns and everything else, right? The people of God, the true Israel, right? And you're in there, not by your goodness. This is why I love it. It's why it's called good news. It's not by how good you are. It's by how good God's been for you in Jesus. That's what you're banking on. And you see, Satan saw that coming. And so when Jesus was born, it was like God drew a battle line and said, now I'm ready to step across. Now it's time. And that's why Satan did all that he could to stop him. In in the birth of Jesus, we have a declaration from God saying, here's this. I'm going to win these people back. And you can't stop them, Satan. In fact, when I'll put my son on the cross and he will go for the joy of the cross, you think you're going to win, but just wait in about three days and you'll see that you've lost. So where we see a baby born, Satan sees a battle begun, but he also knows that it's a war that's going to bring his end. So let me just say it by this. Knowing that part of the story that no one talks about, the revelation part of the story, I think what it does for us is this. I think what it can do is bring a gravity and a weightiness and a goodness, all the more to everything that you're going to celebrate tonight and tomorrow. And I want you to celebrate. I want it to be joyful and joyous. And it should be. And we're going to continue that in our service as we sing carols and we light our little lanterns or whatever. And we're handing them up and showing them up like that. We want to celebrate that. But it makes that celebration all the richer, all the more meaningful, all the more significant when you realize that unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. For that child will go to a cross and arise three days, the greatest king that has ever been, a king who is coming back with a kingdom that has no end. That cosmic kingdom is bound up in that child. And maybe what we need most tonight isn't just the singing, and isn't just the reading of God's word, and isn't just the lighting of candles. Maybe we just needed grandpa, crazy old grandpa, to read us a story we've never read before, so that we might be reminded once again The real stakes in Bethlehem were not just stakes for Joseph and Mary or shepherds or anyone else. They were the real stakes for you and me. That's what Christmas is all about. Let's pray. So as you bow your heads and you close your eyes, I just want to, uh, as you're in a posture of prayer, as as we come before God, I just would like for you to think just in your own heart, God, where am I with you? What would you have me do? What part would I need to play? Because there are some of us, maybe even tonight where we came here, you were totally not expecting for me to say what I said. And it just felt like one curveball after another because of maybe how you've seen God, maybe how you've seen Christianity, maybe how you've seen Jesus. But but maybe something broke through. And it wasn't just because what I said. Maybe because of the goodness of God by the power of his spirit, something just kind of moved in your heart a little bit that said, you know what, Yancey, I... I realize that even now, I I can't perform well enough for God. I I need a Savior. And if you're telling me that Savior was born 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem, and he lived the life in my place and died in my place at the cross and rose from the dead, showing that he's the king of the universe, the king of God's kingdom, I want to be a part of that. Well, then here's what I would tell you. As we pray you would just voice a prayer of repentance and prayer. You would uh, Repentance and faith simply saying, I, I want to turn from being my own Savior, and Lord, I place my faith completely in Jesus. As, as much as I know about who he is, that he's the Son of God that's died for me and rose again, that he's the King of kings, I want to give him my life. You might say that same prayer as we pray. Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for the goodness of Jesus. Thank you for even the images of a, of a baby and a manger and the cosmics just going to and fro as we're reminded this is way more than just a child in a manger. This is the king who's come to ultimately God through him does battle with the evil one to conquer him. Ultimately is his return in Christ. So Lord, we thank you for the goodness of Jesus. Lord, I thank you for the time of Christmas where we celebrate the advent, the coming of Jesus as we look toward his second advent. Lord, I want to pray for my friends in this room. They're here tonight and they're like, yo, they, they want to be a part of the kingdom. They want to be redeemed and brought in as traitors, now sons and daughters. And so, Lord, I pray that you would convert them, that you, by your Spirit, would move their hearts where they would repent of being their own Lord and Saviors and fall at the feet of Jesus. We thank you, God. Uh, Great tidings of comfort and joy because of Christ our King has come. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.